the best at what they do. And uh, bring people like this together. Uh, it's not just going to be the financial capital, the intellectual capital, it's going to be the social capital. Uh, so we get to know each other better and, and, and share inspiration and ideas. So I just really appreciate the opportunity to be uh, an ongoing part of the family. Uh, also want to give a big shout out to Gifford. Um, you know, we're not going to, I meet young people all the time who are uh, facing this strange world out there. Uh, we've told them all the problems, we've told them all the bad news, we've told them that they're all going to die. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Go get them, Tiger. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, they need to be able to go someplace and get trained to do something about it. And uh, that's why I'm proud to be a part of the BGI uh, community. I've got a chance to go up there a couple of times. I've got a chance to speak at one of those great graduations. And I'm also a part of the Presidio uh, family, which is a similar effort. And we need to support those. Uh, those uh, organizations that are supporting our young people, and uh, none more so uh, than Youth Source. Um, I got a chance to spend some time this afternoon uh, with some of the young people right here, from right here in your community you, you may not know about, uh, but I got to spend a minute to brag on them. They're called Youth Source. Um, now look, I'm going to say something to you guys. Um, when you're a young person, and you're trying to make your way in the world, a lot of the imagery about yourself is negative in America. A lot of the assumptions and presumptions people make about you are negative. And what I want you guys to do is recognize that right here in this moment, we have an opportunity um, to signal to the young people in youth source how much they mean to us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to let them know how much uh, they mean to you. The young men I talk to, they happen to be all guys this time, are doing something extraordinary. They're being trained to do something extraordinary. They're being trained to go into buildings that would otherwise be demolished and instead deconstruct them. Now I want you to think about that. The difference between a, a building that's standing there that has value. It has doors that can be used again. It has windows that can be used again. Some of the older buildings, that glass is never going to be made that way again in life. Um, it's got timber. It's got all kinds of stuff that could be used again. But most of the time, what do we do? We go get a wrecking ball, smash it to bits, and throw it in the landfill. What these young men are being trained to do is to go into those buildings and look around. They're being trained the map and the science of figuring out how to deconstruct those buildings and take what's valuable and get it back into the world so we don't have to chop down more trees and dig up more stuff and create more waste. And what's so extraordinary about their achievement is that they're not only demonstrating that doors can have a second chance or door knobs can have a second chance, they're showing that young people themselves can and should have a second chance. Because some of these young guys made some mistakes a few months ago or a few years ago. So it's a second chance for them, second chance for the earth. And these young people are, stand, are here today. I want the youth, source youth, to stand up right now. Let's show them. Let's show them.
some of the people who were running the big corporations, some of the people who were running some of the big banks, some of the people who were running uh, uh, some parts of uh, Washington, D.C., some of the older folks in their own neighborhoods that have left a pretty big mess. And if we can respect the people who are older who made some mistakes, we can certainly respect the younger people when they make mistakes, especially when they decide that they want to be a part of the solution to a problem they didn't even make themselves. And that's the power of this green economy that we're trying to build. We have the opportunity to take people who most need work. And we have a whole generation that wants to work. It is the most creative. I mean, I can't even understand what they're talking about half the time. You know, it's all like Google and Hulu and Yahoo and all this weird stuff. Uh, I mean, they're in a whole other world of creativity. And they want to make a positive contribution. Um, and they need work. We have all these young people who need work. And we have all this work that needs to be done. And there's only one part of our economy that can connect the people who most need work with the work that most needs to be done and fight pollution and poverty at the same time. And that is the triple bottom line green economy. And so, you know, that's what we need to do. But I just appreciate you guys being here. It makes it a lot less abstract. Um, but as you're getting trained in your green jobs and your green careers, and you'll have your ups and downs, and it won't always be easy, um, I just want you to know you're not by yourself. Uh, our friends in the media uh, would sometimes have us believe that uh, the movement for green jobs has somehow been a failure, uh, that uh, a waste. These young folks have company in 3.1 million people who have green jobs right now in America. That's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, you don't trust them because they say, well, that's the Obama administration. I don't, I don't trust them to count their own chickens. Um, you can say, well, fine, let's, let's talk. What, what does Brookings say? Brookings. No left-wing, crazy <laughs> organization, Brookings. Uh, they counted the chickens, they came up with 2.4 million. So, somewhere between 2.4 million and 3.1 million green jobs right now in America. Now, that's with Congress missing in action. That's in the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. That's with our friends in China flooding the world with cheap solar deliberately to wipe out American clean energy companies. In the face of all of that, we still have 3.4, at least 3.4 million green jobs. Uh, how do you get your brain up right now? Let's, let's take uh, a competitive uh, part of the economy, say the coal industry. Now, we may not like the coal companies, but the coal miners themselves, those are American heroes too. They have to risk their lives every day. They have to risk their lungs every day just to keep the lights on in most parts of this country. So we have no, you know, we respect those workers. But um, uh, there are about, only about 80,000 of them. There are 80,000 coal miners in America right now. And there will be fewer as time goes on, no matter whether the green agenda wins or not. You know why? Why are there fewer coal miners today than there were five years ago? Hmm? Somebody said running out of coal. Maybe, maybe not. Huh? Now, here's the... Here's, a very good answer. And the way he says it lets you know that he's very uh, diplomatic. Because <laughs> he said mechanization, which is exactly right. In other words, people like, you know, the coal, the coal miners, their jobs are being taken away. <laughs> How can these horrible, despicable green people <laughs> wipe out the jobs? Of America's coal miners. <laughs> Why do they hate the coal miners? <laughs> Someone should do something. <laughs> you guys see this stuff? Who's taking their jobs? The coal industry itself, which runs the ads, crying about. The 
the coal miners who they are laying off. You know why? Because our diplomatic friend here says because of mechanization. <laughs> I'm going to say it the non-diplomatic way, sir. Because they figured out that if they use dynamite and just blow the mountains up and scrape the coal out, you need fewer workers. <laughs> That's what they're doing. This is called mountaintop removal. That's called blow up your grandmother's mountains and scrape the coal out, and then you're the pink slip. Thank you very much. Now, don't tell me that I don't care about the coal mines. I care a lot about it. And I'd rather them have a better future than to be forced to blow up their grandmother's mountain and scrape the coal out and be unemployed anyway. I'd rather them have a future putting wind turbines on those mountains huh, and powering America in a clean way. So I say this to say that there are 80,000 coal miners. We respect them. But today, right now, we've got 100,000 American workers in the solar industry. Right now, 100,000. We have 100,000 workers right now, Americans, in the wind industry, right now. That doesn't count the energy efficiency work. That doesn't count the workers in smart batteries. That doesn't count the work. You see what I'm saying? So look at what you've been able to achieve. This is in the face of the worst of the worst. You can't get, get much worse than this. And yet the most important part of our economy, and Brookings said, not Van Jones, Brookings said the fastest growing part, the most resilient part of our economy is this green sector. And the reason is pretty simple. It's because you are not trapped in a myth. You're not trapped in a lie. You're not trapped in a false contradiction that has been made up to keep us from doing smart stuff in our country. The way that the opponents of this movement want you to think, they want you to think you've got to answer a, an impossible question. Who do you love more? This is the question they want you to answer. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Don't lock yourself at all, man. No. <laughs> Told you. You want to help him? I think you got to help him. Poor Brian. <laughs> now look, you get involved in public service, anything can happen to you. <laughs> He's he gone. Well, you can walk back in. Huh? We'll lose the whole audience this way. <laughs> Anyway, there's some noise out there. He was trying to help, to, to help me, but I, I didn't want to be like that. Um, now, what was I saying? False contradiction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Taking good notes on the fifth row. <laughs> but it's true. And, you know, we've got some people with fancy educations. I like it. I keep thinking a little bit simple. Here's a false contradiction they want you to be stuck in so you can't make good decisions and grow the economy in a good way. Come down. Who do you love more? That's what they say. Who do you love more? Your children or your grandchildren? <laughs> Choose. <laughs> We're waiting. Because if you love your children, You've got to be concerned about the economy right now. You've got to create jobs right now. You've got to develop right now. So don't you know, cut down every tree. Why? Because we, we want jobs. Poison every river. Poison every stream. Why? Because we want jobs. And somebody says, that seems to be a bad idea. You say, you're a job killer. <laughs> <laughs> So therefore, 
Don't do anything. Just stand very still. <laughs> Try to breathe very little. <laughs> Oppose every economic development program. Right? And your grandchildren will have a wonderful planet. It's just your children will starve to death. I mean, this is how they think. And so then you have this ridiculous conversation in Washington, D.C. Jobs versus the environment. And you say, well, this can't possibly be happening. It's 2012. I mean, it can't, no, no, this can't possibly still be the way that we're thinking. But what you have to understand, you live here on the left coast. <laughs> you get in a plane and you fly to D.C., you're actually flying back in time. <laughs> so, things that make a lot of sense to you here, you know, you get to DC, not so much. So, it really does prevent us from doing smart stuff in America. This, this old way of thinking. The obvious right way to do this is let's grow the economy in a green way. Or let's grow the green part of our economy and create jobs in those parts of our economy that respect the earth. Um, the two big systems you want to move if you think that way, right off the bat, are food and fuel. If, if, if we change the way that we power our buildings and our machines, that's called the clean energy revolution. If we go from the old way of powering our buildings and our machines, um, which is basically to suck dead stuff out of the earth and burn it, <laughs> which doesn't seem very advanced to me. I mean, I mean have you noticed that that's the way that we power civilization right now? I mean, this is you know, not exactly cutting edge anymore. I mean, the reason, you know why we use oil, why we use petroleum? You know why we use it? Because we used to use whale oil, and we ran out of whales. So we're now using the post-whale oil strategy. <laughs> In 2012. I mean, that's what we're doing. And... You know, and it's just, it, it is a bizarre way to, to fuel and power civilization. You take dead stuff, stuff that's dead. Coal has been dead for 300 million years. That's coal. Oil, a little bit fresher. <laughs> It's only been dead for 60 million years. Right. Well, you got other choices, but I mean, those are the two big ones in my life. So you take dead stuff out of the ground, burn it in our power plants and our engines without ceremony. <laughs> and then you're shocked. When you get death in the lungs of our children in the form of asthma, you're shocked when we get death on the oceans in the form of oil spills. You're stunned when we get death from the skies in the form of catastrophic climate change. But you're powering the society based on death. Well, you have an alternative. What if you were to power a society based on the living sun? What if you use living stuff? What if you left the dead stuff in the ground and use the living sun? We have a Saudi Arabia of solar energy falling on the earth right now. What if you use that Saudi Arabia of wind energy in America? Think about that. Make a quick case for that. 
First of all, if you use wind turbines to power America, each wind turbine, 8,000 finely machined parts. 8,000. That's a car. As much steel as in 26 cars. You can put your automakers back to work, your steel makers back to work, just powering America with clean energy. Where do you put all those wind turbines? You don't just put them in the plain states. You can also put them up in the Great Lakes area. You can put them off our coastlines. And the great thing about a wind farm, you build a big wind platform out there in the ocean, and something happens, you have, and, and the wind farm collapses, right? You don't have a massive wind slick that comes. <laughs> <laughs> There's no wind slick that comes and messes up everything. It's a smarter way to do I always say it's a smarter way to do something. See, we keep digging these holes for all this dead stuff. But America's future is not down those holes. If you want to see the future, look up. If you want to see the future, look up. Look at the sun. Look at the wind. Look into the eyes of these workers sitting there idle in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and elsewhere who could be making the products of the future. Look into the eyes of these young people. If you want to see the future, look up. So that is the clean energy revolution. Change the way we power our buildings and our machines. But there's another one too around food. Fuel and food. Change the way we power our bodies with local and organic food. And get the poison and the pollution out of our food system and let people grow food in natural ways with more work and more wisdom. Less poison, less pollution. See, there's a way forward where we create meaningful job opportunities and deliver to America more work, more wealth, and better health. That's a future we're fighting for and working for. And that's the future that we have, uh, we had within our grip in 2008. And no matter you know, how you voted in that election, um, you, you have to agree with me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, there was this guy and who ran the office, who I happen to like quite a lot, 2008. He said four things. He said, climate change is real. He said, climate change is caused by humans. He said, the answer is a program called cap and trade. And he said, if we put it in place, it will create more jobs for America. Climate change is real, caused by humans. Cap and trade will fix it, and it'll create more jobs. Unfortunately, that guy lost. His name was John McCain. But another guy ran it. He had the same program, and he won. I can't remember his name. <laughs> what do you think about it? Less than four years ago, the leader of the Democratic Party and the leader of the Republican Party could only agree on two things. One was the general direction that the sun rises in the morning. <laughs> and the other was Captain Trey to fix the climate problem and create jobs. They fought on every other issue. If you all believe me? Show me. They had, what, three debates? If you can find the clip where McCain turns to Obama and says, cap and trade is, I mean, what, you know, climate change is a fraud, or it's just, we don't know what's causing it, or, 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 or cap and trade is socialism, or, or it'll destroy jobs, then I'll give you a million dollars of his money. <laughs> Not that he has a million dollars. But he's safe because he'll never find it. They, you show me the ad that McCain ran saying anything I just said wrong. This was absolute common ground for America four years ago. And you, all of you in this room, helped to leave whatever political party you're in. You helped to leave that. You helped to get us there. Because we're not a dumb country. This is just straight science and economics. But then the people who might lose a little bit of money in the short term 
decided it'd be better to stop the whole thing. And they engineered a 30-point swing in public opinion on climate change by one of the most aggressive uh, propaganda campaigns ever in the history of our country, uh, spending you know, literally hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to promote false science and to attack real scientists and to cripple our Congress. It happened right in your country. This didn't happen in you know, some terrible dystopian you know, movie. This happened in your country in the past 20, 30 months. And the heartbreak that you feel often the frustration that you feel often is easy to project onto one guy. You know, that was well, Obama's fault. It's just those dumb people in the red state's fault. It's the polluters' fault. But this says something about our country. It says something about us. And the limits that we are still operating inside of within this green movement. We have to get bigger. We have to include more people. Which means we have to take seriously uh, people that frankly a lot of us left the red states and came to Seattle to get away from. <laughs> yes, I'm talking about your right wing cousin <laughs> who posts things on Facebook. <laughs> that you try to answer twice and then just give up. <laughs> because you know, I can't communicate with them or with her. Oh, yes, yes, people cry, yes. <laughs> but guess what? It doesn't work. It's fine to have our strongholds of sustainability. Portland, Seattle, Twin Cities, Bay Area, Denver. We need those strongholds. But we can't stay here. We can't stay here. More people should have been on our side when the lies started coming down. Let me tell you one group that should have been. I'll tell you a few more that we'll sit down and talk about. It. I'll tell you one group that should have been on our side. The libertarians. Exactly. The libertarians. The people who most people Encourage to fight us, and then we say somehow the mean things about. But the, the, the libertarians, what do you say? Well, we believe in free markets, and we don't believe in all this government, and we just, you know, we just believe in that individual liberty. Well, why don't you should mention that individual liberty? I mean, I get a chance to go all over the country, I talk to red states. In fact, the only people who ever come to hear me speak now environmentalists, and Tea Party members. <laughs> it's true. The environmentalists come to cheer, and the Tea Party doesn't. <laughs> uh, but they come. Uh, they, you know, you know, expecting me to say something. And, I, and I'll tell you, this is a true story. You know, we didn't talk about this before, but this is a true story. Um, whenever I speak in the red states, you know, Tea Party folks, they come and approach us and say all kinds of mean things about it. And I always go out and talk to them. And the police freak out. Van Jones is going to be killed. You know, they try to stop me. I say, you know, these people. They're not going to do anything to me. Walk right up to them. First thing I say, what branch did you serve in? About 80% of them were in the military. Just like my dad. Let me start right there. My dad's in the Air Force, he's MP. And we talk. We tell him, come inside. Come inside. Stand out here protesting. We'll clear the front row for you. And if I say one thing you think is unpatriotic, you raise your hand, I'll give you the microphone, I'll sit down. And the, the few times that they've taken me up on it, uh, and they yeah, have, it's been really an amazing experience. Because the first thing I'll say is, yeah, appreciate your, your values, I understand it. Grew up in the South, grew up on the edge of a small town. My dad was a cop in the military. And I know you guys believe in liberty. But I, I don't know if you really stand by what you say. See, I'm not mad for 
we're being too patriotic. In a country like this, is no such thing. I just don't think you're patriotic enough. Let me change something. Let's talk about liberty for a second. Shouldn't every American have the right and the liberty to power their own homes? To put a solar panel on their own house? To put a micro wind turbine in the backyard? And sell that power on a public grid to anybody who they want to sell it to? And compete with anybody in the world? Including the power company? Why are you letting Americans be dictated to? By monopoly power. Power companies. Who will dictate to you in your own house how much you're going to pay for your energy. Where the energy bill energy is going to come from. How many asthma inhalers your little girlfriends are going to have in their, in their side pocket. How why are you sitting here letting big power companies dictate to America? We don't have the right to sell our own energy to each other on our own power grid. But you won't stand with us. You say you don't want subsidies for energy companies. Well, neither do we. <laughs> so why don't you help us take the subsidies away from the folks who get them? And if you want to go in a rational order, let's start with the ones who get the most subsidies. <laughs> Why are you picking on us? We need a little tiny subsidies. And got to beg every two years to get them extended. If you really don't want subsidies, let's talk about the oil companies. I don't see you out there when the oil companies come. BP, Brit, uh, used to be British Petroleum, now they call it Beyond Petroleum. BP, my favorite company. <laughs> They make $60 million a day. Every day. Wait for it. In net profit. Think about that. I mean, when they get finished with all the oil rigs, they get finished with the yachts, they get finished with the corporate headquarters, they get finished with the advertising, every, all their expenses, when they get done with all that, every day, this morning, from the time you got up at 9 o'clock, now it's almost, whatever, 5 or 6, Ooh, 620. <laughs> they made $60 million in net profit. $60 million. You can go back to the Pharaohs. <laughs> you won't find anybody ever in human history that's ever made $60 million a day in net profit every day. But they get subsidies from our government. They get subsidies from our government right now. Coal companies the same way. 150 year old industry still getting subsidies. If you, so if you are against big government subsidies, you should be running past the Sierra Club. <laughs> Sierra Club, like, what was that blur? <laughs> Some red, white, and blue streak just went right by me. But how's he done? You open your meetings, Tea Party. Say the pledge. Sing the national anthem. Close with what? God bless America. No, no, close with America the Beauty. But you got these people destroying America's beauty for money. And you let these little 350.org kids be the only ones out there fighting to defend America. <coughs> Where are you? Now, that's tough on them, but it's respectful. Because I'm saying, I understand your value. One thing that we, one reason we don't have the support that we deserve is because we get these little blue strongholds sometimes. And we put people down. We insult people. We say, these stupid red staters. My God. <laughs> you have anybody here under the age of 18? 
Okay, so excuse my French for a second. That's why we're little kids again. But we're grown folk here. <laughs> I had friends of mine. No one I'm a southerner, by the way. No one I'm a southerner who went to public school, grew up in the church. I had friends that was telling me, as if it's funny, that we were just referred to the, the big, vast heartland of America. So we, we've got to get on our side if we want to make any progress. Refer to the whole of Red State America as, quote, dumb fuckistan. <laughs> dumb fuckistan. I mean, it's kind of funny, but I mean, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's creative, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. It might give you some sense about why then they are not wrong when they say that we are elitist. Folks aren't stupid. You know, I love to hear liberals, these people. I mean, they vote against their own economic interests, man. I mean, what can you do about people who vote against their own economic interests? I mean, they're just. I mean, I just give up. Is that what they're doing? Think about it. Is that what they're doing? You know who really votes against their economic interests? Liberals. There's a tax on the, on the ballot measure, right? There's a tax measure on the ballot. I'll vote for it! <laughs> what, what is it? I don't know! <laughs> It must be for the good, you know. <laughs> I mean, is that stupid? I mean, you're voting against your economic interests? You're voting for money to come out of your pocket? He's like, well, no. It's noble. I don't just think about my economic interests. I'm not that crass. I have ideals. I have values, you see. Oh, okay. So, do that. Well, actually, it's the same thing. Here's how I'm, you may not know, I'm a progressive. If that <laughs> Here's how we sometimes sound to them. We mean people like myself, I'm sure we have some conservatives here. But here's how liberals sometimes sound to conservatives. It sometimes sounds to them. You guys are trying to bribe me with free stuff I didn't earn. Yes, I'm willing to have these programs cut that I need because I don't want to be bribed by free stuff you took from somebody else that I didn't earn. Yes, you don't have to tell me I need this stuff. But my concern is for my children. You're creating programs where my, where my children make bad mistakes. It doesn't matter because you're going to bail them out anyway. That's undermining my parenting. It's not stupid. We may disagree about it. But if, it's, if you could understand why you would be willing to vote to have money taken away from you because you're more than just your economic rational calculation, then you have to also respect why somebody else might be understandable if they're willing to have programs taken away from them because they're more than just their economic calculation. We have a responsibility if we're going to have a movement big enough to include everybody or enough people to overcome the worst of our opponents. We've got to be bigger. Now, you guys know I've been uh, sometimes other, uh, treated other than well by our friends on the right. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. My kids, and hopefully someday my grandkids and their kids, aren't going to want to hear that somebody said something mean about me on TV. They won't even know what TV is, I'm sure. 
<laughs> and that's why I didn't do everything I could think of to give them a better future. And we can't, as a movement, be so traumatized by stuff that happened to us not three years ago, but 30 years ago in high school. <laughs> Which is why half of us moved to the coast anyway. Half of us are still running from 11th grade. That's why we're so glad to be here. Woo, Lord! But we can't have those traumas run our movement. We have to include more people. We have to include more people like our friends from Media Source. The green of movement can't just translate as a way for affluent people to spend more money. It's got to also be a way for people who are not affluent to earn some money and save some money. And that's what this weatherization work and deconstruction work is all about. You know, lastly, uh, you know, there's people in the rural parts of our country who should have stood with us. You know, when you hear about solar power, you know, not you, but your friends think this way. Solar power is for hippies in Berserkly, California. <laughs> that's, 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 how, that's, how, that's, how, that's how people think. So solar power means hippie power. When in fact, it's cowboy power. When in fact, it's rancher power. When in fact, it's farmer power. Why? We might manufacture some of those wind turbines in blue states where there's a bunch of industrial capacity. But we're not going to deploy a whole lot of wind turbines in Manhattan. We're not going to build a big solar farm in Manhattan. We're going to build wind farms and solar farms in the red states. We're going to build wind farms and solar farms in rural America. In fact, this agenda would put Money, earned money, in the hands and in the pockets of our struggling rural sisters and brothers, family farmers. If you put a wind turbine up, especially if you have a grid that will let it connect anywhere, you can earn ten to twenty thousand dollars a year just to watch it turn. Now, how many of our family farms would be losing right now if we had that option? for rural America. And then they could also grow an energy crop, not corn, we shouldn't be burning food as fuel on a hungry planet, but algae and other advanced biofuels, that's a second earned paycheck. And then third, think about this, if they, those family farmers go back to the old way of farming, get away from this poison-based agriculture, right? Because that's what, what it is. Poison-based agriculture. You, you know, you know, you know they, they, our farmers use something called pesticides. Anytime you hear the word side. <laughs> it's usually not a happy story. Homicide. <laughs> suicide. <laughs> pesticide. Yeah, that'll make a good meal. It's called what it is, it's called poison. Get away from this poison-based agriculture. Go back to the old ways. Organ organic, permaculture. People haven't made the case. Guess what? You're going to be capturing more carbon in the soil. Huh? You're going to be sequestering more carbon in the soil. Getting the soil rich again. Getting it dark again. And guess what? You can sell those credits on the carbon markets and get a third earned paycheck if you come our way. If you're a part of this revolution in clean energy and local organic food, you begin to create a virtual cycle for rural America. Did we make that point to anybody? Or are we busy being self-righteous? So there's a way forward, but it's through a deepening of our hearts first. As big as our heads can sometimes get, and our vision can sometimes get, those old hurts can make our hearts too small to get the job done. And so 
Uh, I'm proud to be a part of this movement, and I'm happy to get a chance to talk about it. Uh, I like the fact that the questions that we ask in this movement are questions that liberals like. Liberals like these questions. How can we save the earth? Liberals, oh, I just love that. <laughs> and they say, how can we save the earth and help the poor people too? They go, oh, oh. <laughs> this is a great, great question. I like that. But I like the fact that the answers that we're getting are answers that conservatives can like too. See? We're not calling for more green entitlement programs. Sometimes we need entitlement programs. That's not the heart of our case. We're not calling for more entitlement programs. We're calling for more enterprise. We're not fighting for more uh, green welfare. Sometimes we need welfare. That's not the heart of our case. We're calling for more green work. We're not primarily trying to redistribute anybody's wealth. We don't think these oil companies deserve all our money. But we, we, we primarily are trying to find new ways for entrepreneurs to create new wealth. We stand on the side of enterprise and work and innovation and the best parts of America and saying that America's government should be on the side of the problem solvers in our economy, not the old problem makers who got enough of our money in the first place. So this should be a common ground agenda. And it's my great hope that we will go forward now looking for new friends, new converts, new markets, new ways to grow this great movement. If we do that, our kids will be very proud of us and our grandkids too. Thank you.